Hi, my name is Kino Zhao. I am an assistant professor at Simon Fraser University. I'd like to tell you a little bit about my new paper titled Measuring the Non-Existent, Validity Before Measurement, forthcoming in philosophy of science. We often think of measurement as a kind of mediated perception. A microscope lets us observe bacteria, a ruler lets us measure the length of a rod, a thermometer lets us observe temperature. According to this correspondence picture of measurement, we start by identifying a target in the world that we like to study, say a wooden rod. Next, we develop a measurement theory that tells us what kind of instrument is appropriate for which kind of property. A ruler to measure length, a thermometer to measure temperature, for example. Finally, we determine the validity of our measurement results by seeing if we have applied the instrument in our hand appropriately to the target in the world. Philosophers Hasok Cheng and Aaron Tal have both put pressure on this straightforward picture by pointing to its epistemic limitations in cases that are more complex than using a ruler to measure a rod. Chang has pointed out that many measurement targets are such that we do not have measurement independent access to them. How do we know if a thermometer reading is accurate if we can't know what the temperature truly is independent of that reading? On the other hand, Tall has studied cases where the actual measurement target isn't physically realizable. In contemporary timekeeping, the exact physical definition of a standard second cannot be realized because we cannot keep particles at zero degree Kelvin. Consequently, the naive idea that to measure well is to capture the true target without error is practically unrealistic and, as a result, scientifically unhelpful. Both Chang and Tao advocate for a kind of coherentism, where measurement involves a back and forth between evolving theories of the target on the one hand and the developing measuring instruments on the other. In this paper, I look at a different kind of difficulty with the correspondence framework of measurement and propose a non-coherentist resolution. Researchers in psychology, sociology, and education have had a long history struggling with the measurement of social constructs. Similar to the case of temperature, we do not have a measurement independent access to social constructs that could allow us to verify the accuracy of our instruments. Moreover, not all social constructs have legitimate scientific standing. If I'm trying to measure the length of a rod and the rod doesn't exist, it would be pretty obvious to me why my endeavor wouldn't work. However, if I'm trying to measure a person's mathematical ability through a test or a questionnaire, I will always be able to retrieve some results, even if our best theory of the mind denies the reality of subject-specific abilities. These facts make it incredibly difficult to distinguish fictitious measurement results from valid ones. Part of this difficulty is, the, is that validity is often understood within the correspondence framework as the accurate description of a target that exists in the world. We're supposed to identify the target before we start taking measure. The measurement itself isn't supposed to be responsible for the existence of the target any more than the microscope is responsible for the existence of the bacteria. I think this way of understanding measurement is unfortunate because it not only overestimates our, our ability to identify measurement independent targets, but also underestimates the potential for measurement to shape both our perception of the world and the world itself. Here, I draw on the literature in the history and the ethnography of quantification. Through a detailed examination of how modern accounting, actuarial science, and civil engineering began, Historian Theodore Porter argues that numeric measurements are invoked in social contexts, not for their precision and objectivity, but for their false appearance of precision and objectivity. That is, numeric measurements are used to disguise the kind of political decisions that are necessarily biased and arbitrary by making them appear as if they were precise and objective. Other scholars have similarly written on how plant classification affects forestry practice, 
how the reclassification of housework as unpaid work leads to the reconceptualization of not only the wife's role within the family, but also what counts as labor, and how measuring human trafficking through the criminal justice lens, as opposed to a human rights one, changes our theorizing around possible remedies of the problem. Understanding measurement through the correspondence lens underestimates this creative power. It lets us assume that to measure is to faithfully document a property that exists within the target, and whatever we find in the results must be true of the target. As I have argued, this is false. Instead, I advocate for a validity-first framework of measurement. This framework builds on a new approach to validity that is adopted within the education testing literature, but remains controversial elsewhere. According to this argument-based approach to validity, validity is not a property of an instrument that accurately describes the world. Instead, validity is the property of a result that it adequately serves a purpose within a context. On this view, to know if a test of mathematical ability is valid, we need to first ask what this test is designed to do. If it's designed to predict student success in an advanced math class, then the test scores are valid just in case people who score high on the test do succeed in this class and people who score low do not. This is very easy to determine. The benefit of this approach to validity is that it ensures that a judgment of validity says no more than is warranted by evidence. A limitation of this approach is that it doesn't help us answer important scientific questions, such as, does mathematical ability exist? I believe that this limitation is in fact a feature. Given measurement's inability to faithfully track truth and its tendency to change the world through its application, we ought not to expect validity judgments to be able to tell us anything about ontology. What if we do want to know ontology? Since statements about the world are more contentious than statements about usefulness, I think it only makes sense that we need to work up to ontology through careful theorizing. Suppose I find my test of mathematical ability to be useful in many new and surprising contexts. Then I can develop a theory about what it is that my test is doing that might be responsible for its validity across contexts. In other words, I develop a measurement theory based on the validity results. Later, I may use this measurement theory alongside other theories concerning mental abilities and test taking to develop a theory about the existence of mathematical ability as a scientifically legitimate construct. This validity first framework puts validity at the ground floor of the epistemic hierarchy because validity as usefulness is the most empirically testable and least contentious. In contrast, the claim that the target of measurement has a validity-independent existence in the world is the most contentious and naturally calls for the most caution. In conclusion, I described how currently popular conceptions of measurement and validity follow a correspondence framework where to measure is to identify a target in the world and document its properties. I argue that this framework gives measurement both too much and too little credit, since it ignores both the practical limitations and the creative potentials of measurement, especially within the social sciences. In its place, I propose a validity-first framework in which validity comes first, measurement comes later, and ontology is the ultimate grand prize.